welcome Ravi Venkatesan. Can we have Ravi on, on screen or on stage? So Ravi okay. Venkatesan is a renowned business leader, social entrepreneur and author from India. Over the years, he has led several companies. He has been chairman of Microsoft India during 2004 to 11 when India became Microsoft's second largest geography and fastest growing market. He has served as the chairman of Cummins India and Bank of Baroda. Ravi has founded the Global Alliance for Mass Entrepreneurship more recently and currently also chairs the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. He's an alum of IIT Bombay, Purdue and Harvard, Harvard Business School. He has also served as UNICEF's rep special representative for young people and innovation and uh, has written some best-selling books like What the Heck Do I Do With My Life? How to Flourish in our turbulent times, uh, uh, conquering the chaos, been in India, been everywhere. So, so very, uh, very interesting speaker uh, we have with us today. So, welcome, Ravi. And I know you're on holiday in Italy, and uh, really want to thank you for for doing this in the middle of your vacation. So, uh, re really appreciate that. And uh, I, I want to just open with a with a with a broader question. We saw a bunch of young students with us in the previous panel uh, and uh, they, they shared some very interesting thoughts on what they look for from their teachers and so on. What is your thought on how we will prepare uh, the youngsters of today for the world of the future, for the 21st century and, and beyond? Uh, love to hear some opening thoughts and then maybe follow it up with a couple of questions. Well, thanks, Ramya. I'm delighted to be here, but on vacation or not, the opportunity to engage with so many thoughtful people, influential teachers is just uh, something I couldn't turn down. So to your question, look, <clears throat> I think we all feel that there's something very different about the times we're living in than the past. And the way I would say it is um, this 21st century is going to be about a period of just incredible, unprecedented change. So in one of my books, I wrote uh, a a statement which I keep using all the time, which is the world will change more in these hundred years than in all of human history. And this is going to be a challenge. I heard that some of the previous uh, panelists, uh, the young folks are talking about mental health issues. Well, fasten your seatbelt. I mean, you haven't seen anything yet because there is so much that is just changing at an exponential rate, right? On one hand, you've got climate and what the you know the backlash of the planet the revenge of mother earth you've also got a, a technology just reshaping the world in unbelievable ways and so on so the question is look how does the education system have to change in in order to prepare young people for the future and you know one more example of i think why this whole paradigm needs to be completely reimagined you know for the last hundred years, or maybe even longer, there was this strong connection between education, good education, higher education, leading to you know good outcomes. So a good education was your ticket or passport out of poverty. For my parents, it certainly was for a large part, number of their generation. Education was how they came into the middle class. And then my generation did the same thing. We stood on their shoulders and we became more affluent. Today, this connection between education and good outcomes in life is completely broken in every country, but particularly, let's say, in South Asia and Africa. So I was stunned that a young person with a higher education degree today in India is six times as likely to be unemployed as somebody who's illiterate. So what uses an education then? And we used to think this happens only to people from really third tier colleges and so forth. Nonsense. This year, about a third of the people graduating from the elite IITs and IIMs of India are still looking for a job. So this is a very, very big, big, big shift. And it's only going to become worse, Ramya, with, uh, um, as AI becomes more and more embedded in society, in all our lives and so forth. So already we know that early as it is, Gen AI can do be better than at least half humans at so many tasks, whether it's composing an article 
or whether it's writing a software program or interpreting x-rays or you know if you look at reviewing a legal document any of these things it's doing better than half of the human so what are we going to do so the main thing i want to leave behind is look i don't know the answers but i do know that the education system in every country is preparing young people for a world which no longer exists quietly it stopped existing about 10 10 years ago and for instance what do we teach young people we teach them how you know facts with so much of our grade 1 to 12 or even beyond that is about learning facts well today any child with a cell phone has access to all the world's information so much of what we teach young people in school and colleges is st- structured problem solving well it turns out ai is much better at structured problem solving than humans ever will be and so what we've got to do is think about in this changing world which is both complex and uncertain on the other hand being resculpted by technology how are we supposed to the what are we so human supposed to do and the answer in my opinion is well a you've got to be learn to be more uniquely human there's no point competing with ai at what ai is better at you know and the second thing is i think there are three skills with, or three mindsets which we need to make sure every young person develops and the, in a nutshell the first mindset is what has been called the growth mindset which is how do you know how do you retain and strengthen curiosity experimentation risk taking um your attitude towards failure and setback resilience instead of falling apart okay so this is something that's like a muscle that has to be cultivated a second critical mindset is an entrepreneurial mindset look i get it that not everybody wants to be an entrepreneur and start a business or even can be successful at that but in the 21st century if you're going to survive and flourish you better have an entrepreneurial mindset so what does that look like it's it's the ability to rec- recognize and see opportunities and seize them um uh, you know there's this uh, nice quote which i like talking about you know an op- a pessimist is somebody who sees a problem in every opportunity and optimist sees an opportunity in every problem so we have got to train young people in every problem to see the opportunity and then act on it another entrepreneurial mindset quality is resourcefulness none of us have resources when we start but you learn to bootstrap yourself you have to learn to problem solve you have to be tenacious all these things are part of what we call the entrepreneurial mindset and the beautiful thing is it's not something you're born with it's something that you can learn in fact we're in game which you talked about in the introduction we're running the largest entrepreneurship curriculum in the world um in the school government schools the poorest government schools in 10 states it's being done by uh, our partner udyam learning foundation i don't know if they're part of this but mekin and udyam they pioneered this curriculum for grades 9 to 12 and it's utterly transformational we can talk about that in, a, in our little fireside chat and the third just really really important thing that we've got to get everybody um you know equipped with is a leadership mindset you know people still in the 21st century think about leadership as position and power and title and those sorts of things so and so is a ceo so and so is minister or whatever um uh, a big title that's not leadership leadership at the is actually a, an act it's a verb not a noun it's how you how you behave in a situation and therefore everybody is capable of leadership and that's what we have to realize leadership in the 21st century is unlikely to come from the people who have the formal power and authority it's going to come from people like you and i and in this conference uh, you know those listening in particularly the young folks they have to start acting on the problems and the things the issues they care about without waiting for the for a formal mandate about it and again this is something ramya be Uh, had huge experience particularly through my unicef work uh, we can go in, into the poorest poorest socio economic backgrounds and get young people to start 
seeing that they're not victims that have to be re rescued. Their problems are not going to be solved by somebody else, not by the teacher, the principal, the government. No, you have to learn to solve your own problems. And if you do that, you know, you, you know the world's going to cooperate. So any case, long, we have not much time, but I really, really think we need to help um, young people develop these three mindsets. And final thing is, look, the last thing we need to do is force people down certain paths. Not everybody needs to become an engineer. Not everybody needs to become a doctor, a CA or whatnot. The world has plenty of bad engineers already and bored engineers. I think what we need is a lot of young people who love what they do and do what they love. Okay, the whole idea of Ikigai. So big part of our education process has to be helping young people experientially discover what, what is their purpose? What are they best suited for in this life? And yeah, so more on that if you wish. Wonderful, wonderful. No, very, very, uh, very inspiring, uh, Ravi. And uh, in fact, I am seeing multiple uh, people in the chat trying to summarize bits of that. Uh, thank you very much, Mohammed Jabir, David Joseph, Prakash Medhikar, Esther George. Very helpful for the entire audience when you try to summarize pieces of what a speaker has said. So, so really appreciate the contribution to the, to the community, all of you. Uh, so, so Ravi, the, the mindsets you talked about, growth mindset, entrepreneurial mindset, leadership mindset, any thoughts for teachers on what they can do in their day-to-day -day interaction with students to, um, to, to build or, uh, I mean, build is a strong word, let's say, uh, enable, foster some of these mindsets uh, along with what, what they do uh, in, in, in the normal course of things. Yeah. So first of all, these things cannot be taught in a classroom. Um, and that's the bad news. The good news is you can definitely learn them outside the classroom. So I, I vividly remember uh, in Punjab, we were working with uh, uh, some youth organizations. And the kids in some school were really frustrated that the school toilet was broken. And it was broken for a long time. They've gone and complained and nothing happens and so forth. And, you know, the, the, finally, we found a teacher who said, look, why don't you guys go fix it? And they were first a little surprised and shocked. How do you expect me to fix it? Who am I as a student? And that too, you know, if you're a girl student from a certain, certain whatever class, you feel disempowered. And so, so what you say is, no, look, tomorrow you come back and come back with two, three friends who are also frustrated and want to fix the same problem. And then you help them get it done. And that's when the light switch turns on. Okay. So they, they start realizing that, look, I have agency. I, took, I don't have to be rescued by someone and wait for somebody else to fix my problems. I can actually try and take charge. And once this light switch turns on, it's, it's, you know, it's just leads to fantastic outcomes. So these are small things a teacher can do. A teacher can ask questions and get people to think rather than providing answers. Um, you, you need to encourage curiosity rather than put the lid on it. Okay. So look, I often talk about a particular teacher I had in eighth, eighth grade in, in school. I was a terrible student till then, you know, seventh grade, just terrible. I was really bad at studies, lacking self-confidence. And then this school, school teacher one day said, look, Ravi is going to be a great scientist. And at that point, there was no evidence I was going to be great at anything, let alone a scientist. But I started believing her. Okay, and so I started studying harder that year. I did really well, and then the rest was history. So the power of a teacher to open a mind, provide self-confidence, uh, help people see that they're not powerless little victims, but can you know take on more and more and more, is just boundless. This is why, by the way, I think I don't have any fear that j j AI or anything like that is going to replace teachers. Okay. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that the future is very much uh, teacher-centric. 
but the teacher has to learn how to use technology to to be better at what they do and use technology to in, get students inspi inspired and so forth. Anyway, this, this is a longer conversation, but um, yeah, then there, there are many, you know, Sal Khan in his book talks quite a bit about some of these things. So yeah, yeah they're better sources than I. But, but very, very interesting thoughts, uh, Ravi, and, and the example you gave, I, I think the power of that example for me, the one about constructing the toilet is, uh, on one hand, it may not be within an, an academic subject of a classroom, but on the other side, the teacher is playing a powerful role. And I'm hearing that on the chat as well, where Frank Osai of Ghana is talking about how some of his students approached a problem and solved it. Radha Vishwanathan from India is talking about how she is creating certain real life kind of problems in the classroom and getting students to approach that. So, so uh, very interesting. Sorry, you were saying something. Yeah, I wanted to get, I was just in Kenya uh, yeah. talking of uh, Africa and uh, I ran into someone who talked about lion lights. So it turns out there's this young kid and at night the lions would attack the livestock, the cows and kill them. But then he used his flashlight and scared them away. And then he thought, hmm, this really works. Why don't I build something on it for my neighbors? And so he built this thing with flashing lights and that would repel predators. And he's now an entrepreneur and he was encouraged by his teacher and school to, you know, develop his idea into a real product and a real business. The power of a teacher to encourage a young person with an idea is just extraordinary. Wonderful, wonderful, Ravi. And last, last question before we, before we let you go. Uh, any, any advice for Senta uh, on what we should be doing to continue on this journey of supporting teachers? Oh, that's a long question, but I think, first of all, just connecting us, sharing practices, experiences um, is big. I suppose if you're able to create an, a, a real community with a directory of solutions and interesting ideas that are working, that would be useful. Um, I would say having a recognition program, I, I think it's just a pat on the back, a little peer recognition goes such a long way. So I don't know if you already, I don't know enough about center, but if you're already doing it, fantastic. But otherwise, you know, recognizing some of the best teachers for the work they do would be fabulous. I could go on and on and on. But thank you again for having no, me. No, here. Glad, to, sure glad to hear that. No, sorry, yeah. uh, sorry, I interrupted you. But, but no, glad to hear that, Ravi. I think a lot of what you've said seems to seems to reinforce some of the things we are doing, some new ideas, and so and and sorry, you were ha having some closing words when I interrupted. There's a bit of a bit of a lag. Yeah. No, no problem at all. I hope I've got people thinking a little bit at, at the end of these 15 minutes. And take care. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much again, Ravi, for being with us. And. Uh...